information that has never been seen by the public before. So join us on Facebook and Twitter. Become part of the investigation. Here's Ryan Smith. Welcome to the spring commencement at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It's graduation day 2014 in Chapel Hill. Faith Hedgepeth was supposed to have been here. She was supposed to have dressed in Carolina blue, waved triumphantly to her family, and basked in the achievement of a degree from the nation's oldest and they'd say best public university. And of course, a perennial basketball powerhouse. This is the place that she had wanted to come all her life. This was her dream. All degree candidates, please rise. That was the dream. Congratulations. 911, where is your emergency? But this is the reality. I just walked into my apartment and my friend was just like, to be unconscious. How old is she? She's 19. Is she breathing? I don't think so. Okay, listen to me. There's blood everywhere. There's what? There's blood everywhere. Faith's mother, Connie, is called. She said, well, Miss Hedgebeth, oh, I'm sorry to tell you, but Faith is dead. The stunned matriarch relays the news to the family, including son Chad. He said, what is it, Mama? I didn't know what to think. Faith's dad, Roland. I said, are you sure, Connie? To daughter, Rolanda. I said, what? And I just collapsed. So sparse are the initial details, the family is left to wonder exactly how Faith died. Did she get caught up with the wrong people? Was she just at the wrong place at the wrong time? Did she commit suicide? Breaking news is first at six. But it isn't long before WTVD, the ABC-owned station in Raleigh-Durham, starts reporting details about the case. Police are treating Hedgepest's death as a murder and say they don't believe it was a random act. We want to know everything. We want to know why. UNC was supposed to be a beginning for Faith, not the end. She received a scholarship, full tuition all the way through graduate school. That scholarship was the ticket out of her tiny hometown of Hollister, a place filled with good people, but little else. Faith, a Native American, grew up a member of the Haloasaponi tribe. <laughs> A native people who've called this part of the country home since before there was a country. It's a place Faith promised to return to one day. It meant enough to her to want to come back and help her community after she achieved in life. Absolutely. That was home to her and she wanted to make a difference. The transition was not always smooth. At times, the grades suffered. So adjusting to the class load was a bit difficult for her. So she did struggle academically, but she decided not to give up on Carolina and attaining a Carolina degree. What was never in doubt was Faith's ability to connect with others on campus. Faith was a very social person. She instantly had connections on campus, and she instantly caught the attention of men on this campus. She just smiled all the time. I know I'm a smiler, but she had me beat. She definitely knew how to kind of make you feel safe, make you feel happy. The band of sisters quickly forms. In her freshman and sophomore years, Yuna and Patty, roommate Karina, and friend Marisol Rangel become tight with Faith. She had friends everywhere. Um, she would make friends so quick. And there were plenty of other friends to make. Faith Hedgepeth hits the books by day and the social scene by night. She liked to dance. She liked to be in a loud room full of people talking. She enjoyed going out. She's certainly not alone. UNC students know how to throw a party. And at this school, everyone's invited. But Faith maintains her priorities, at times holding down two jobs. While waitressing at the Red Robin, Faith posts on Instagram. A customer has added a heart around her name on this bill. Faith mocks her uncanny ability to charm with a caption on Instagram that reads, I make my guests fall in love. She will be dead five days later. When her roommate Karina comes home and makes that emergency call, which will itself become part of the mystery, police now want you to help solve. There's blood all over the pillows, like in the comforter. I just can't believe this. How many murders happen here in Chapel Hill? Uh, generally, we average less than one a year. Chief of Police Chris Blue doesn't just protect a town. He must protect an image. The university is one of the state's largest employers. 
when co-eds turn up dead for mysterious reasons, students start worrying about safety. The lack of information has students who did not know Faith on edge. We just want answers and kind of give us a little peace. That's bad for business. The pressure to solve this case is immense. We don't stop. We don't quit. The police focus on the unsentimental business of investigation, and there is no shortage of evidence. We're trying to make some sense of the literally thousands of pieces of information that are coming in and prioritize. But in the absence of an arrest, speculation rules the day, and everyone has a theory. I do believe Faith's death was a personal vendetta. I don't believe that this was random at all. Coming up, did being the life of the party lead to Faith's death? Was there a frenemy inside her own social circle? And is that person hiding in plain sight? You don't know who you can trust. You don't know who you can talk to. And later, your very first look at a high-tech image that may reveal the killer's identity when we return. Twenty twenty continues with love, hope, and faith. The week after Faith Hedgepeth is brutally murdered, the university holds this vigil, honoring her with a Native American ceremony. Faith, I love you, baby. Meanwhile, investigators are trying to tackle the puzzling case by retracing her final hours. A jigsaw still being worked on today, four years later. One that Lieutenant Salisa LaHue loses sleep over. Just a couple weeks ago, I woke up in the middle of the night and a name popped in my head and I couldn't place it. So I had to get up and come into work. So there isn't a day that goes by that we don't look at Faith's case. For the most part, the Chapel Hill police have played things close to the best when it's come to releasing information. But tonight, for the first time, they are opening up with brand new evidence, asking your help to advance the case. There may be another piece of information out there that this story will shake loose in somebody's mind. This is the police timeline. The evening begins with Faith and roommate Karina Rosario on campus studying. They went to the student library on campus, which is called Davis Library. Faith steps out and pays a visit to the apartment of a male friend. Faith left for a short time and then came back to the library and picked Karina up. And they went back to their residence at Hawthorne at the View. Hawthorne at the View was the name of an apartment complex. This overhead shows exactly where the two lived. You have to follow the road all the way to the end to find it. They shared the second floor apartment, number 1502. Did you find any surveillance video from this complex? There was no surveillance from this complex. Inside the apartment for only 30 minutes, the teens are now ready for a night of dancing. Police say they locked the door behind them. About 10 minutes later, they enter the popular Thrill nightclub on Rosemary Street. Thrill is one of the common nightclubs that undergraduate students, particularly those that are younger than 21, can still get into. This security camera footage, never before seen by the public, shows an overhead view as the women walk into the club. That's one of the club's bouncers, escorting them inside. Oh, Thursday is popular college night for, I think, any college town, so of course it would have been super packed. What transpired in the club that night? It's impossible to tell from this camera. But less than 90 minutes later, Karina seems ready to call it a night. Yes, she did indicate that she wasn't feeling well when she left the club. That's Karina walking out first, followed by Faith. They spend a few moments talking to a man outside. By 3 a.m., the women are back at the apartment. What's about to happen next looks like the telltale signs of major guy drama at least to this guy. There were a lot of men that liked Faith. There were a lot of men that liked some of the other uh, young women in this case. Columnist Tom Gasparoli has been following the case for years. They're very attractive women and their jealousies and angers and breakups and hookups. Around 3.30 a.m., records obtained by police show that there is activity on Faith's Facebook page. Faith is also texting this man, Brandon Edwards, seen here on his Facebook page. The text, hey B, can you come over here please? Karina needs you more than you know. Please let her know you care. So who is this guy? 
Brandon and Karina used to like talk. I don't know if they dated, dated, but they used to talk. Others have likened Brandon as a big brother figure to the women. Police say Karina's phone records show she is calling Brandon Edwards multiple times around the same time Faith is texting him, but there is no response. So Karina reaches out to someone else, UNC soccer star Jordan McCrary. Every day, wake up, train, grind, and do it all again the next day. She texts Jordan, yes, to come and pick her up at Hawthorne at The View. Was Jordan her boyfriend? I would say he was somebody that she had a relationship with. Close to 4.30 a.m., Faith's roommate Karina leaves her apartment, gets in McCrary's car, and heads to his apartment. She says she left the front door unlocked. At that time, when she left the apartment, uh, she knew Faith to be in bed, uh, in the bedroom. When the sun rises over Chapel Hill, the party's over and school's starting. Karina needs a ride home to pick up a paper for class and then head to campus. When she can't reach Faith, she calls Marisol Rangel for a lift. So I picked up Karina and we came back to the apartment um, and we saw her car. So I'm like, oh, she probably overslept. It is nearly 11 a.m. The two climb the stairs and enter the apartment. They call out Faith's name, but get no response. All I remember is just calling her name just because we knew she was there, like, Faith, Faith. That's when we went to the room. So we found her. So Faith was found deceased, partially nude. Uh, there was a lot of blood in the bedroom, and she had suffered what appeared to be severe head trauma. When police arrived, they see this near Faith's body. This photo, revealed for the first time, is allegedly the murder weapon, an empty bottle of rum. That murder weapon that you mentioned, that bottle, what condition was that in? It was a Bacardi bottle, um, and it was covered in blood, blood smudges. It was a brutal, brutal death. Did it seem like there was forced entry going into the apartment? No, there was no sign of forced entry. Semen is also discovered on Faith's body. Investigators use it to generate a DNA profile. They're convinced that DNA belongs to the killer and that he may also have perpetrated a sexual assault. Is it more likely than not that she was raped? Yes. In the search for Faith's killer, that DNA profile will become sort of a glass slipper. But who will fit it? Next. Police turn their attention to an aspiring rapper who lives nearby. Did he have the motive for murder? He told them that he would kill the both of them, especially Faith. And later, a maverick private investigator sets his sights on another target. That's next. When a college student is killed, the problem isn't a shortage of suspects, it's the surplus. Faith knew hundreds of people. She was very personable, uh, loved by many. So as time went on, it just, it grew and grew. With a young, socially outgoing victim at the center of the case, the cell phone records and social media connections alone give police a vast supply of leads to run down. How many people have you pursued in this case, either for information or as a possible person of interest? Over 1,800. It just boggles the mind when I hear the number, but how hard is that investigation for you to narrow down? You know, it's difficult. Um, again, Faith was very outgoing. She had a lot of friends. Chapel Hill investigators were able to link multiple men to the murdered UNC student. Police say some of the men were reluctant to provide DNA, while some flat out refused. Think about this. In just the 90 minutes Faith spent at the thrill that night, police learned that she mingled with a veritable rogues gallery. There was the crack dealer and gun runner who was also a police informant. An unstable student who police say once threatened to shoot his mother's boyfriend in the head. And the guy Faith walked out of the club with. Cops say when he was later interviewed, he made suspicious statements. All were later eliminated through a DNA process. But checking out each and every story is proving to be a time-consuming process. How do you rein all that in? You eliminate them fairly quickly but you still have to find them and you still have to interview them. And that can be labor intensive. So three frustrating months after Faith Hedgepeth's murder, the Chapel Hill PD asks for help and gets it. 
The FBI comes on board and develops a profile of the killer. Former FBI profiler Brad Garrett, now an ABC News consultant, says a profile can perform a useful, and in this case vital, function of narrowing down the suspect pool. The FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit tells the Chapel Hill Police they believe the killer knew Hedgepeth. You look at all of these head injuries and think about how they were inflicted. You're talking about being as close as you and I hitting you in the head with a bottle. Well, you're looking at me, I'm looking at you. You can't get much more personal than that. The profile goes on to say the killer may have lived close to Faith at one time. That would suggest to me that your killer knows the building, knows the location, and didn't just wander upon this particular apartment building and randomly pick this door and walk through it and commit this horrendous act. The FBI believes the killer has made comments about Faith to close associates. In other words, have said something to somebody, not as direct as I killed her, but something about that sort of puts him in this case. And the profile says the killer may take an unusual interest in the case. They want to look at every news presentation. They want to read every article. They want to go online and talk about it. Chapel Hill police say the profile matched some of the traits of Eric Takoy Jones. The local rapper trying to make it big. Why is Jones so interesting to investigators? because he knows both Faith and her roommate, Karina. Takoy Jones is the ex-boyfriend of Karina, and uh, he had previously lived there with Karina. The two dated until the relationship went sour after Jones allegedly got violent. He was very jealous of Karina, like, and who she could talk to and what she could do. Court papers allege the rapper came into apartment 1502 and was verbally abusive to Karina and pushed her to the ground. Five days later, Jones allegedly broke into the apartment after Karina had the locks changed. So she brought a restraining order against him? Yes. Faith apparently didn't approve of Eric's approach to dating, and a neighbor named Joy said Faith played an active role in seeing his relationship with Karina end. Faith drove Karina to the courthouse to fill out the paperwork to get the restraining order. And after that, Takoy didn't live upstairs anymore. But Eric doesn't move far. He moves into another apartment in the very same complex. After Faith is murdered, Jones comes down the street and sings her praises to WTVD near the crime scene. Faith was the sweetest person in the world. I can't believe in it, but I'm still in shock. Right, it's, it's unreal. Problem is, Faith's friend Patricia Locklear says Faith told her Jones struck a much different tone a few months earlier, even before the restraining order was requested. He told them that he would kill the both of them, especially Faith, if she tried to keep him from, or keep Karina from him. Was Jones so enraged that he would eliminate the woman who stood between him and Karina? In the days before and after the murder, Jones is texting and on social media asking for forgiveness for his sins. He does not get specific. Yeah, I think I was scared of him. Just because it's it's a person that you just like don't know how they're gonna react with anything. Cops won't tell us where the rapper was on the night of the murder, although they do say he was not at the Thrill nightclub. So Eric Takoy Jones, if he wasn't involved in this case, it seems like there are a lot of coincidences surrounding him. At this point in time, there's not enough evidence to arrest Takoy Jones. Eric Takoy Jones has at least one thing going for him in this case. He tested his DNA. Yes. Was he a match for any of that DNA on Faith or in that apartment? No. But cops say there's a chance he knows who is a match. Is Takoy Jones a person of interest in this case? He remains a person of interest. We made numerous attempts to contact Mr. Jones and finally reached him. The man who at one time couldn't stop talking about the crime. Uh, whoever did is deserves the burn. Now says he'll have no further comment for 2020 or the Chapel Hill police. So far, there have been no answers. <laughs> All of a sudden, it's the first anniversary of the murder. It doesn't get any easier. Uh, it's always on my mind. Roland and the rest of the family attend this flower-filled memorial on campus. Well, I prayed it. 
we won't be here next year talking about, you know, the case is not solved. But at this point, in 2013, the family members are the only ones talking. The police have clamped down on any public statements. I can't think of a murder like this, of a college student, high profile in a small town, a college town, where so little key information was talked about or released for so long. Frustrated by the sound of silence, columnist Tom Gasparoli decides to make a little noise of his own. Good to see you. I decided to start a blog and do whatever I could, as provocatively as I could, to get some information or to keep the story out there. Gasparoli attempts to fill in the blanks by focusing on Faith's male acquaintances. Some of the gentlemen around the situation, the guys, college students and otherwise, they didn't want to talk. But the drip drip of information is about to change. Next, police release a trove of disturbing new evidence, including a note cops say is written by the killer himself. Who leaves a note? Uh, serial killers sometimes leave notes for the authorities. Who was this note for? And who was it written by? Could a butt dial phone call provide a valuable clue? It's just my baby girl's voice. Stay with us. We return to 2020 and love, hope, and faith. The case that nearly everyone assumed would culminate in a quick arrest is now moving at a glacial speed. Nearly two years later, and with at least two agencies investigating, there have been no arrests. With each passing day, frustration grows. I know that police officers probably have a lot of different cases, but it's like, when it's someone that close, it's like you want an answer. So two years after the murder, pressured by local media, including WTVD, the department releases hundreds of pages of details and evidence in the case, which gives the public its first real glimpse of the crime scene. What was some of the most important evidence that you collected from the bedroom? There was a biscuit bag that was from Time Out Restaurant. Time Out is very popular in Chapel Hill, and it's immediately identifiable. Faith had gone out the night before, stopped at Time Out, and brought food back to the apartment. But now, that same bag contains five angry words. On the bag was some writing that said, I'm not stupid, bitch, jealous. What did you make of that? Obviously, big evidentiary value. The note is found on the bed. It is written in pen. Police say both the note and the pen have the killer's DNA on it. So police believe he wrote it. But here's a puzzle. While the room is covered in blood, the note is not. My biggest concern about the note was that there was no visible blood on the bag or anything. Police say the cleanliness of the note suggests the killer's hands, once bloodied after using the bottle as a murder weapon, didn't flee immediately. Instead, he may have taken his time to wash his hands and write that five-word screed. Adding to the mystery, police can't say for sure who the note was left for. As to the intended target, per se, about the note, there were two residents there, and it would make sense the note was left for one of them. I think the Korean knows what happened to Faith. Faith's father, Roland, has long suspected that Karina is the key to the case. 911, where is your emergency? He is among a group of people who find her 911 call questionable. For starters, we know that Karina came to the apartment with Marisol Rangel, yet Marisol is never mentioned or heard on the call. Well, the 911 call was made a little after 11 on Friday morning by her roommate, uh, Ms. Rosario. It sounded as if she were the only person in the apartment. She was not. Columnist Tom Gasparoli also finds it odd Faith's name is never uttered on the eight-minute phone call. The caller was talking about my friend. I just walked into my apartment and my friend just like to be unconscious. She never said Faith's name. When you touched her, how did she feel? She's so cold. She never said, oh, Faith, oh, my God. She's in my bedroom. What happened, Faith? Downstairs neighbor Joy says Karina also had a memorably serene demeanor as she exited the apartment to await the police. That's the striking thing. You would never have known that they had just come from discovering a what turned out to be horribly brutal murder scene. Roland's mind churns with questions. Was Karina expecting to find Faith's dead body that morning? Did she know someone was coming to the apartment that night with bad intentions? And fueling his suspicions 
another clue that keeps him up at night. You're listening to a voicemail that came from Faith's phone on the night of the murder to her friend, Una Chavis. It was probably unintentional, the result of an accident we've all made. She's notorious for doing a butt dial phone call uh, where she accidentally calls somebody with the phone in her pocket, so I just assumed that was what it was. If it sounds undecipherable to you, you're not alone. But when we brought Roland into WTVD to tell us what he hears, he was unequivocal. I hear screaming in the background, in his face voice. We're screaming. Please, get off me. Roland's assessment is simple. His daughter is in grave danger. It's just my baby girl's voice. And I know her voice. The distraught dad searching for closure? Maybe. But friends hear Faith too. I do hear her voice, and it does sound like she's yelling, maybe upset, maybe trying to get somebody's attention, but she does make some type of noise. And she was my friend. I knew her for two years. I talked to her every single day, so I'm sure that it was her voice at that point. We brought others into the studio for a listen as well. Gasparoli says what he hears sounds like an argument. Well, right there. Possibly the two roommates fighting. And possibly a prelude to murder. It sounds like there's a female who's very angry, very intense, speaking in staccato. Police will say only that the timestamp and the voicemail itself confirmed that it was received while Faith and friends were at the Thrill nightclub. Listen to what could be music. There is speaking and or music in the background. Uh, you can hear certain pitches of information. 2020 presented the tape to a lab used by the FBI to see if it could be enhanced. They said it could not. The voicemail. Where is your emergency? The 911 call. The testimony of the downstairs neighbor. We tried to get some clarity about this from Karina. So, after numerous attempts to reach her, Karina? Hi, I'm Ryan Smith with ABC News' 2020. We went to talk to her ourselves. Okay, I just wanted to know if there was a chance for us to talk to you. We just want to clear the record on the Faith Hedgepeth case and really just kind of get your story out. Is there any way that we can talk to you at some point? We just had no other way to reach you. She did not want to talk to us, but she has been talking with police. A lot. How many times has the Chapel Hill Police Department interviewed her? Um... I would estimate over 10 times. Has she been cooperative? Yes. From that 911 call, do you think that there was something that Karina was hiding? I think that um, there were questions that resulted from that 911 call that we had to clarify with Karina. And whether or not, you know, she is giving us all of the information that she knows and or um, truthful information, you know, continues to be under investigation. Karina Rosario. No. She has never been a suspect. Police have made that clear to us. But she didn't mention Faith's name on the 911 call. Is that a problem? No, and the reason why, when people are in crisis, every one of us do it, we're in a tunnel. So it's entirely possible that Karina is telling everything she knows, and when the killer is finally caught, it may be somebody she never suspected. Exactly. But now the family isn't just waiting for the cops to solve the case. They've turned for help to some private investigators who are about to come up with their own theory about someone who they feel has handwriting resembling the letters on that note. Coming up, will it be the police or the PIs to track down a killer first? And revealed for the first time tonight, the DNA generated face that may launch a thousand tips. Hunter Glass has a more direct approach to criminal investigations. Hot damn bam a lamb. Acquire target. Always gotta have something fun to shoot at. Eliminate target. This Army airborne vet and ex-cop, now a private investigator, has been working Fate's case on and off pro bono for the past two years. We're gonna do it. We're gonna get the guys or the people involved in this, I promise you. From the beginning, Hunter has theorized that the murder stemmed from an argument between Faith and Karina, possibly over dating or relationships. 
Do you think what happened to Faith may have started at this club? I believe that it actually started before this club. I just think that Faith found out about it at the club. Hunter also thinks the infamous butt dial call from the club is evidence of a heated dispute. Even though, again, police say it's unintelligible. Sound like, help me. It's like almost a scream, help me. What's the accelerant that happened in that club that led to Faith's death? Well, it's written on the letter. Jealousy. I believe that we may have an angry person who was very jealous of Faith. But here's the trouble with the theory. It means the murderer was probably a man intimately connected to Faith or Karina. And by now, practically every man connected to them at all has been swabbed and eliminated by police. Eliminated is a tough word. They weren't a match. It doesn't mean that somebody doesn't have further knowledge or somebody isn't involved in, in Faith's death. It's really the central contradiction of the whole case. Despite all the indications the killer was inside Faith's social circle, the DNA says the killer has to come from somewhere outside, someone with at least one degree of separation. To find him, Hunter brings in fellow investigator David Marshburn. What's the game plan? Game plan is, is I know you can't, there's nobody can hide from you. So we gotta go find some people. The duo door knock until their knuckles are raw. And as they pour through case documents, they turn their focus onto one of Karina's old friends, Brandon Edwards. She was involved with Brandon at one point. Remember, Edwards was Karina's friend, who Faith texted that night, telling him to come over. I want to find out where he's working. He's doing a background on him. Edwards had been swabbed and eliminated as the killer. But Marshburn learns that at one time, he lived with an ex-con with a violent past, someone who police have not tested yet. We look up his criminal record. He has got assault on a female after assault on a female after assault on a female. The PIs head to that apartment the two men shared. They get the lease application completed by that roommate and notice what they say are handwriting similarities between the writing on the application and the writing on the murderer's note. You can see the N, you can see the L. All these things point to the same direction and the way the writing is on the on the bag. Marshburn's no expert, but Durwood Matheny is. Something that stands out right now is the E. It looked like a C with a line through it. I will be looking to see if I can find that kind of E. With a trained eye and decades of experience as a forensic document examiner, Matheny agreed to take a look at the writing sample at Marshburn's request. Him just committing a murder and writing this note, does that make a difference in his handwriting versus him being calm or nervous? It could, yes. And also, the surface that he writes on, if he was writing on a counter or against the wall mm -hmm. or on his leg, uh, this can change handwriting. Just observing, am I on the right path, maybe? From what I've seen, I do see some similarities. Matheny's preliminary exam sees enough similarities to warrant further study of other samples from the same guy. Marshburn turns over his findings to the Chapel Hill Police Department. And even though there's no clear connection between this man and Faith, tonight, police are looking to get a DNA sample from him to match against the killer's profile. He could be a suspect in this case, as I don't know. All I'm suggesting is I wouldn't hang my hat on this handwriting situation based on the limited sampling that you have. But the police are pursuing their own lead, generated by something so high tech, it makes CSI look like Sesame Street. DNA taken from the semen at the crime scene and sent to Parabon Nano Labs in Virginia to come up with a composite of the killer. What Snapshot is doing is treating the DNA like a blueprint, because in that genetic code is the information for how to build that person. It's called phenotyping, the science of predicting physical appearance through DNA. A snapshot predicts eye color, hair color, skin color, freckling, face morphology, and ancestry. So is this person very fair, fair? Each trait prediction comes with a measure of confidence. In this case, all are fairly high. This person has dark olive or light olive skin, brown or hazel eyes, most likely has black hair. Most likely this person has zero freckles, 
but we can't exclude that they have a few. We typically see this profile um, in Latino individuals. The snapshot is not your typical police sketch. The 3D image looks real. They've been used in dozens of police investigations around the country. Now look closely. Tonight, 2020 is revealing for the first time the image that the lab and the police say could be the face of a killer. We can be very confident that this is not a white person, this is not a person of African descent, and this is a person who is very strongly Latino. Do you recognize this man? And critically, do any of Faith's friends see what's next? Love, hope, and faith continues on 2020. It's been nearly four years now since UNC student Faith Hedgepeth was murdered and her killer has still not been found. We've just revealed to you this remarkable facial composite generated from the DNA of Faith Hedgepeth's murderer. Tonight, the question, will it make a difference? Will someone watching tonight who knows this man and the truth finally decide to speak up? Everybody out there has a conscience and someday somebody's going to say something that leads us to that one bit of information that we need. We showed the picture to Faith's friend, Marisol Rangel. That doesn't even look like anyone I know. Police say Karina's seen it, but it didn't ring any bells. As for the men involved, Eric DeCoy Jones, Brandon Edwards, Jordan McCreary, none of them agreed to meet with us. Just last month, a group of fresh-faced freshmen took up residence at UNC. They will walk the same campus as Faith but have no memory of her at all. I've never heard that name before. No, I have not. But back in Hollister, where Faith grew up, they will never forget. Each year, the family holds a fundraiser and gives two scholarships. They want Faith's spirit to live on in other young women. This is the right thing to do, to, to kind of keep her name and her memory alive and do it in a, in a positive way. And despite four grueling years, Chief Blue remains resolute. If you were to put a percentage on this, what chance do you think you have of solving this case of finding Faith's killer? 100%. For family and friends, anything less simply won't do. If I could say anything, I'd probably say I'm so sorry that this happened to you, but I'm sure she's enjoying life in another universe that's much better than here. Sorry to cry, guys. Well, if you think you might know something that could help Chapel Hill Police, we hope you go to our website tonight, abcnews.com. We've got all the contact information right there. And, of course, we will stay on this case. And we have this program note for you. Be sure to watch the very first presidential debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump right here on ABC after Dancing with the Stars Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. I think a few people will be watching. I think so. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. I'm David Muir. Thanks for watching on a Friday night. And from all of us here at 2020 and ABC News, have a good evening.